Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines here at Virtual Heights Presbyterian Church and pressing on in the book of Romans. And uh, let me make sure I got this pointed at the right thing here. And it should work. There we go. And we are on Romans 1, verse 18. And this is where Paul uh, begins to spell out um, the problem. You really cannot understand the Christian faith uh, at all unless you understand the doctrine of man's fall into sin. Um, and if you have a, a biblical... Um, understanding of what sin is and how it affects the human race and how it affects and impacts radically God's attitude toward the human race. So let's go ahead and dig right in here. Paul, after his introduction and in, uh, greeting to the Roman church, and then he gives the kind of the summary statement, the purpose statement of the book. We'll back up two verses here. Romans 1.16 uh, Paul gives the theme, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then verse 17, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God, the the dikaiosune uh, theu, the righteousness of God, meaning the, the gift righteousness that was achieved by Jesus Christ in obedience to the Ten Commandments, obedience to the covenant of works that he entered into. That's what Galatians 4, 4 and 5 is talking about when it says that when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. And see, that's the problem that we have is we all sin. Uh, we do not keep God's commandments. We don't keep his, his commands to love him and to love neighbor as ourselves. And because of that, we are under God's judicial curse. And so we need a righteousness that is, as the reformers called it, extra nos, outside of us. We need what, what Martin Luther called a justitia alienum, an alien righteousness, a righteousness that is achieved by someone else outside of us, and that's who Jesus is, and that's what he does. He, he achieves the very righteousness that is imputed or legally credited into our account such that we can then be declared just in the sight of God. So in it, in the gospel, this righteousness of God, the dikaiosune theu, um, is revealed from faith to faith, from faith to to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith so there you have the, the theme of the book the whole book is about the revelation of the righteousness of god of the gift righteousness that was achieved by jesus christ the god righteousness that is the very basis upon which alone a sinner can be declared righteous and thus enter into heaven itself and that is the the heart of the christian faith that's the heart of the gospel of our lord jesus christ Okay, so now Paul immediately to begin developing this theme of the righteousness of God that's revealed in the gospel, the gift of righteousness achieved by Christ, he's got to spell out the problem. Everyone's got to understand this part, the, the wrath of God, uh, the, the anger, the judicial anger that God has uh, against the human race for its, its sin, its violations uh, of his laws, which are a reflection of his own holiness. That, that's why uh, God can't just decide to forgive people. Uh, satisfaction of his wrath, of his righteousness, must be rendered. And that's why Christ came, and that's what the whole Old Testament is about. The coming of Christ, the sacrificial system, the the, the victim in the place of the, the sinner, the animal that is slain in behalf of, of the sinner. Those are all preparatory. Those are all pointing forward to the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's why in the Christian church, we don't have an altar upon which we, we offer sacrifices. We have a table where God gave us the, the meal, the Lord's Supper, to remember the one sacrifice that he offered for us. Okay, so with that, uh, Romans 1.18, here's the beginning of the problem. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, is, is actually present, is being revealed, apocalyptati, is, is present uh, is passive, but it's um, it is being revealed from heaven, okay, from heaven against all unrighteousness. That's asebeon and unrighteous or, or all uh, ungodliness asebeon and unrighteousness kai adikion and unrighteousness of men anthropon. So men are ungodly and they are unrighteous. So the righteousness that God requires from us, we don't have. We are, we are unrighteous, and therefore his wrath, this term or gay, wrath or anger, is being revealed from heaven by God against all the ungodliness 
and unrighteousness of men, and then it uses a, this is a actually a, a, a substantival participle here, the ones suppressing the truth. The, the one, this, this uh, genitive article here wraps up this whole phrase right here, this, this uh, participle here is in the same, um, has the same case and uh, number uh, and gender as this, so katakon, um, or katakontone, they're the participle, against the ones suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. God's wrath is revealed from heaven, not just against the ungodly people and the unrighteous people, but against those who are actively engaged in suppressing the truth. What does that mean, to suppress the truth? The illustration that I've heard theologians use to describe this term here, this uh, verb katecho, um, the form that it's in here is a katakontone, katakontone, uh, refers to the holding down, the, the suppression of something that we know is there, but we don't want it to be there. Think of it like the a, a really big beach ball when you're in a swimming pool. Um, you you can wrap your arms around the beach ball and try to, to push it down in the pool, but it, it just it just keeps bubbling back up. It'll you can't hold it all the way underwater if it's a really big beach ball. And eventually, it just keeps coming back up. That's kind of what men do with the truth. We don't. It's not just just that men don't understand or don't know the truth. It's that they do know it, but they suppress it, and they suppress it to the point of self deception. They suppress it that far. Okay, so men suppress the truth in unrighteousness, meaning their commitment to sin is so great, is so great that they hold back the truth. They don't want the truth. They don't want the truth to, to be known. They don't want it themselves. And they are actively engaged in suppressing the truth so that it doesn't bubble up, but, but you ultimately can't escape it because it's everywhere. Now, he goes on to explain what he means. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them, or God has shown it uh, to them. Okay, phanerao, this, this term here, this aorist active uh, third person singular verb right here, uh, phanerosen. Um, God has shown it to them. What? what? What can be known about himself? God has demonstrated his existence, his uh, true existence and his attributes are revealed in creation itself. The created order itself bears witness to the fact that God is real, he is there, and that we've we've all angered him. Now listen to what he goes on to say here. Verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature, that's the, the term theotetas, okay, the, or the, theotes, theotes, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made. So men and women throughout the world cannot look at creation and not know that God's there. They, they, they all know that a God exists. They all know that it's this God who exists, that it's a God who is holy, who made all these things. And everybody knows in the deepest part of their hearts that they've angered him too. Now, many people will say, no, I don't. I don't know that. I know, because you're suppressing it, is what the Word of God teaches. You're actively engaged in suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Our commitment to unrighteousness makes it so we do not want to know the God who is holy. We're not interested in him. We don't want to know him. But it's obvious that he's there. God has shown himself to every man in creation. The the wisdom, power, um, and greatness and majestic glory of God are seen in creation. This is taught not just in Romans 1 here, but it's also taught in Psalm 19. Okay, um, Here, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork day unto day, utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, etc., etc., etc. Okay, and so everybody knows this God who is real. Everyone knows the God who exists. Okay, verse 20. Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. And that's a very important term that's translated without excuse. It's actually one Greek word, anapologetas. Anapologetas, which means without a defense. Inexcusable. 
Human beings do not have an excuse. No one can claim ignorance. No one can say, oh, I just didn't know, or uh, my, my parents potty trained me too late in life, or something. Nobody has an excuse for not knowing God. In fact, um, it says in verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. How? The creation of the world. His eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen in the glory and the, the grandeur, the complexity and the, the way that everything works together and the, the laws of nature that God has put in place that governs uh, human experience and makes it intelligible. All of that makes it clear to every human being that God is there. So nobody has an excuse. Nobody can say, as Bertrand Russell once tried to say, Sir, why have you taken such pains to hide yourself? <laughs> uh, um, he, he didn't say that to God when he died, and I promise you. Okay, what, is, what can be known about God is plain to everyone in creation. Romans one twenty one continues the indictment why God's wrath, his anger, is revealed. For even though they knew God, it says Nantes Tan Theon, knowing the God, the God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. They did not glorify him, doxadzo, they did not give glory to him, nor were they Eucharisteo, thankful. They did not give Eucharisteo, you, uh, they did not give that to God. They didn't glorify him and didn't thank him. So think about that. Think about Adam when he was created in the Garden of Eden, when he opened his eyes for the very first time and, and saw the creation and saw God. His first instinct would have been to glorify God and to thank him. And you might think, well, glorify him for what? For the, everything he made, including himself, and thank him for what? For his life. For his life and for making him in God's image so that he could have communion and fellowship with God and enjoy God. That is the chief purpose of man. Whether you're a Christian or not, the chief purpose of your existence is to glorify God. You exist for communion with this God who created you. But the problem is as long as we are in our sins, as long as we are unregenerate, as long as we're not born again, we will not ever see that and we won't believe it either. And we'll just keep right on suppressing the truth and stay committed to our sin and so on and so forth. Because although they knew God, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. And their foolish heart was darkened. You think about what is, the, what is one of the best ways to describe the human race and sin? It's just dark. You look at man's ideas, apart from divine revelation, about politics, about um, social Darwinism. Man, man trying to understand his place in the world, really, really since the Enlightenment turned its back on God. Look at the culmination of all of that in the 20th century. With the world wars and the death camps and the rise of communist ideology, where you teach people there is no God. It's not that they, can't, it's not that they can actually not believe in God. They just deify something else, namely the state. And the tender mercies... The tender mercies of those communist states were cruel. Okay, so when they were when they were mad, they were cruel in a way that's unheard of in the history of the world. Okay, man is futile in his thoughts. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand economics. He doesn't understand the world around him. He doesn't understand marriage, family. Man does not understand how to be happy. Man doesn't understand how to be blessed in anything he does in life without God, which is why he hasn't been. Okay, so they became futile in their speculations. What, what does it mean by, by speculations? They became futile in their thoughts. Okay? The, the thinking of a man deliberating with himself is what, it's, is what it's talking about. So the man, you know, sitting there thinking, what are his thoughts as he's contemplating the world? Mostly error and poison. Mostly wrong. I mean, man's been able to figure out some stuff using science. Of course, science presupposes this God's existence and, and presupposes that this God governs the universe uh, and upholds, he, he preserves and governs it by his divine providence, which, which enables us to do science and to um, have things that are law-like in their characteristics so we can study it. And that's part of the Dominion Project. That's why human beings have an inborn curiosity. But that being said, man apart from God is a fool, and he doesn't understand why he's here, and he doesn't understand what he's supposed to be doing either. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. Now, you gotta, you got to chew on that for a minute. They profess 
to be wise, Sophia. <laughs> Sophia. Remember, in, during the Enlightenment, the philosophes. Philo, love, and Sophia, wisdom. Philosophes, like Voltaire and Diderot and all of them. They were the lovers of wisdom. Mm, not really. <laughs> not really. Not really. They profess to be wise. They profess to be wise. But what are they really? Fools. Mo rhino. <laughs> Mo rhino. That's where you get the English word moron. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Dirt became life. All by itself. How do you know that? Uh, I don't. Did you ever see it happen? No. Why do you believe it? Well, because if I don't, then I might have to believe that God made me, and I can't believe that. Professing to be wise, they became fools. I'll say we just evolved. All by ourselves. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image, an icon, similar to, in the form of, the likeness of corruptible man. The incorruptible God was exchanged for something corruptible, something that decays, something that is not worthy of worship. And four-footed an birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. You know, as I recall from the, my study of ancient Egypt, the oldest Old Kingdom statue of a pharaoh in existence is the pharaoh Raneferef. And it's a statue of his, of his head with Horus the hawk with his wings wrapped around his head. So the ancient Egyptians worshipped Horus the hawk. A hawk, a, a bird. They, they were enamored by that bird. And they worshipped crocodiles and cows and mummified them and cats and ibises and birds and everything else. Men exchanged the incorruptible God, the God of glory, the God who is majestic in his power, infinite in his kindness, uh, whose mercy extends to the clouds, whose glory is over all his works along with his tender mercies. We exchanged that to worship a mummified cow. Professing to be wise, we became fools. We, we exchanged the glory and the blessedness of knowing God for sex, for money, for fame. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, in light of that, in light of the fact that God revealed himself clearly to man, and man suppresses the truth and unrighteousness, universally men suppress the truth and unrighteousness apart from the new birth. Therefore, dia, God also gave them up to uncleanness. He gave them over in the lusts, the epithumia, the lusts of their hearts. He gave them up to the lusts of their hearts so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Isn't that interesting? You know, one of the ways in which human beings lash out against God is disrespect of our body. Disrespect of the body. Abortion is one of the ways that man strikes out at God. It's destroying God's image. In mankind, cutting ourselves, mistreating ourselves, sexual immorality. These are all ways. These are the lusts of our hearts and the dishonoring of our bodies. The uh, atemazo. Okay? Temao means to, to honor. So atemazo means to dishonor. Dishonoring of their bodies among them themselves. So where you see the human body dis discarded and slashed up and cut up and everything else, that's where you see human beings being given over to the lusts of their hearts. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Again, think about that. Human beings know God's there. They know he's real. They know that he exists. They know that he's angry. They know that he's their creator. And they see his divine attributes reflected in his works. But they exchange the truth of God for a lie. They want a lie instead. Well, why? Why would someone want to lie? Because if they don't get that lie, then they have to turn away from sin and follow God and obey him. And that's one thing that the unregenerate man does not, or woman doesn't want to do, does not want to obey God. So they will believe a lie instead. And for years ago, before I really understood regeneration and understood the 
the need for the new birth, I, I always thought, how could someone really be a liberal Christian? I don't understand that. How, how can people say the things they say that the Bible actually condones, which obviously it doesn't, and on all sorts of things, all sorts of topics? How can they do that? Well, because they can't see. Because when human beings read the Bible, there are spiritual things going on. There are spiritual things happening there. Every time someone reads the Bible, there are spiritual realities that people can't see. If someone is unregenerate, they're not going to desire to believe it, and they're not going to desire to follow it either. What are they going to desire to do then? To exchange the truth of God for a lie. They want to lie. Lie to me. People will believe the most inane arguments to keep themselves from having to turn their back on their, on their favorite sins. And people don't realize that how powerful slavery to sin really is. I mean, it's very powerful. S being a servant, a slave of sin is powerful. And also, if a person has not been given a love of the truth by God, they will believe in love a lie. They will believe in love a lie. Listen, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, talking about, I believe, the... the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and the rise to power of Nero and his persecution of, of God's people. But it says here, with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. People do not love the truth. Loving the truth is something that God creates in the heart of his redeemed people when he makes them born again. They will hate lies and love truth. And this is why witnessing to people, sharing the gospel with people who are as yet dead in their sins, blind, deaf, um, is, can be such a frustrating thing. It can be such an incredibly frustrating thing because they do not love the truth. They love falsehood. They don't want. They do not desire to turn away from sin. They love sin. And verse 11, for this reason, God will send upon them a strong delusion. Really? Yeah. God. God will send upon them a strong delusion so that they will believe what is false. But why would he do that? Because if someone is determined to hold on to sin, God will say, okay, I'll, I'll give you over to it then. I'll send you a delusion so that you'll just love that lie. A strong delusion so that you will believe the lie in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. You hear that? That's so tragic to me. It's so sad. It's so completely senseless. People die in their sins. Why? Because they love unrighteousness. They take pleasure in sin and therefore I don't want the truth to be true. They exchange, they willingly exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. They worship stuff in creation, themselves, their own bodies, their own sexual desires and interests. And I think it was one of the Huxley men when they were promoting Darwinism. You know, they were, you know, I think it was uh, Thomas Huxley was called Darwin's bulldog. And I've seen the quotations where they said, we wanted this life not to have meaning. We want life not to have meaning. We want, we want the Bible to be false because it frees us to pursue our own sexual interests. I think, well, at least, at least some of them were transparent about it. This has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with facts. It's we want to pursue our perverted sexual desires. That's all there is to it. And so, therefore, what's true is not allowed to be true. Yeah, well, the text of Scripture says this. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. I mean, it's, it's really sad. It's really sad. And I remember finally becoming reformed in my theology and realizing, wow, the only reason that I can understand it and believe it is because God has opened my eyes. Okay, now listen to the next verse. Romans 1, 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Okay, so de degrading or dishonorable. There you have the, that term atomia again, atomia. Pafe, desires dishonorable desires okay and now listen closely to the next section here for their women exchanged the natural use for that which is against nature their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature that is talking about lesbianism okay there's nothing here about rape there's nothing here about um 
consent or anything of the kind. It is simply women exchanging the natural use for what is against nature. And then it goes on to include, of course, in the next verse, uh, male homosexuality too. And in the same way, also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Now, there's nothing here about victims or little boys or rape or anything like that. Men with men. Here it is. Here it is in Greek. Arsenes and arsenen, committing what is shameful, really is what the, uh, the verb here means, disgraceful, doing disgraceful deeds, <laughs> okay, and receiving in themselves the, the penalty of their error, planes alton, of their error, which was due. So there's nothing, whether it's consensual or not, it's simply men with men is unnatural. Because it is parafusin, because it is against nature, it is immoral and wrong. And everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. So verse 26, lesbianism. Verse 27, homosexuality with men. Male homosexuality. Now, <clears throat> this is highlighting just how far human beings who suppress the truth and unrighteousness are willing to go in their rebellion against God. Just how far they're willing to go in their exchange of the truth for a lie. They will even do this. They even engage in this kind of behavior. That's what Paul is emphasizing here. So deep is man's rebellion that he will go against even what the created order itself, the physical body parts themselves, the way they're designed to work together, they'll even deny that. They'll exchange the truth of what is plain and obviously revealed in creation itself, in the male and female body parts, for that which is para busen. Very simple. Nope, no translation issues here. Um, it's very simple. And look at verse 28. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, to do those things which are not fitting. You know, people ask all the time, you know, do you think homosexuality is a sin? Of course it's a sin. It's parafus and it's against nature. That's Paul's argument. His point is you don't, you don't need to have, like, you don't need to own a Bible to understand this one. This one is, is spelled out in the created order itself. But what people don't realize, however, is that, yes, it is a sin, but it's also a manifestation of the wrath of God itself. The rise of homosexuality is itself the wrath of God. It is itself a manifestation of his judgment against a culture. So it's not that it brings it, it is the wrath of God, is what the um, text of Romans 1 is teaching us here. Because people suppress the truth and unrighteousness, they exchange the truth of God for the lie, therefore, they're given over to this. So it doesn't just, doesn't just provoke God for its sinfulness, which it, it does, and it is sinful, but it's also a manifestation of his wrath. The rise of homosexuality is itself manifestation of God's wrath. Verse 29, being filled <clears throat> with all unrighteousness, this, this depraved mind that we're given over to, all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy. I mean, our whole culture, is, is, it's all about envy. It's all about envying what other people have and murder. Think about all the, the unborn children that are murdered every day in this country. Why? Convenience. Nobody wants them. You know, I, I was able, by the mercy of God, to participate in the, in the saving of a life of a child. Uh, there was a lady from Ethiopia who was uh, down at that abortion clinic in uh, Cincinnati, in Sharonville. Uh, she was 20 weeks pregnant. She was there for, uh, for her abortion. And we got her a sonogram, and she saw the baby, and she started to cry. And um, that baby, they decided, she, they made the decision, her and her boyfriend made the decision to keep it. And they were going to have an abortion because it was their fifth child, and she said they couldn't afford it. 
And I told her, we will supply everything you need. And we did. We filled a, a, a 15 passenger van to the top from the floor to the ceiling with everything they would ever need for years for that child. And I remember when that baby was born, I got to hold it. I got to hold the baby. And our church paid for the cesarean section. She had to get a C-section. And the dad sent me a text that day and said, thank you, pastor. You saved our baby's life. I said, well, I was just one little cog in the, in the machine of God's people that worked to save her life. And she was beautiful, just a precious, beautiful little girl. And I'm so thankful to God that she's alive. So thankful to God that she's alive. Her name was Soliana, Soliana. Um, so I'll never forget that name. I have a picture of her along with six other babies that, um, that we talked women out of getting abortions. Um, and those, those children, I wonder what they're going to do, like how, how God's going to use them. So murder, murder is another thing that people do, um, when their minds are depraved, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers. They lie about people constantly. Haters of God, theostuges, hating God. How, how do you know someone hates God? They hate his word, or they try to change it, or they read it and they say, well, that's not what it really says. You know someone's a God-hater then. Okay, hubristos, hubristos. You ever heard the Greek word hubris? Remember the Greeks, people said that their civilization fell because of hubris? Well, that's part of the depraved mind, hubristos. Insolence is what that's saying. Arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Being rebellious against your parents, not listening to your parents, is an example of the heart of mankind being given over to a lie, to falsehood, to idolatry. Without understanding. Okay, uh, undiscerning is what that term uh, asunetas, asunetas, undiscerning. Now, undiscerning means looking at something that's plainly and obviously wrong and not being sharp enough to recognize that's wrong. That's what undiscerning means. If someone is without discernment, that's evil, that's sinful. Okay? Without understanding, undiscerning, untrustworthy. You can't trust this generation that's coming up now. It's so godless. I mean, I don't let my kids ride their bikes very far from my house. I used to ride my bike everywhere. Not anymore. Why? Our culture has exalted vileness, and therefore the wicked prowl on every side. Read Psalm 12. Read it slowly. Read it carefully. Untrustworthy. I don't trust people. I don't know. Hardly. Unloving. Unmerciful. Wow. Verse 32, last verse of the chapter. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. But what does that mean? They, although they know that, they, they know in the deep part of the heart. Now, if you ask them, they'll say, we don't, we don't know what you're talking about. This is all fine. It's all good. Everything's, everything's fine. Everything's okay. You're, you're the biggest. You're mean. You guys are nasty. In their hearts, they know those who practice such things are worthy of death. What that means is they know it makes them worthy of hellfire. They know, that, they know it does. They will say it doesn't with their mouths. But in their hearts, they know. They know. Although they know that, they not only do the same, they not only continue to do it, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. They not only will continue to do that which they know will damn them for eternity, they also cheer each other on. They approve of. They, they hold hands with. They encourage others to commit the same sins that they do. That's how dark the human heart is. You know, Romans 1, <laughs> it's not going to sell a lot of books and, and get a lot of people happy, clappy, excited. But the thing is, it's true. And that's the end of Romans chapter 1. I know that's, uh, that's rough stuff, and, but it's the truth and it's what makes the gospel that much more glorious because every sin I just listed there all those sins and the sin list there in Romans 1 29 through 32 all those sins they destroy everyone every one of us is listed in there somewhere if not with all of them and remember the law of God overlaps to break one commandment is to break them all that's the bad news 
Because that's true of every human being on earth. And that's what makes the good news that Christ's righteousness has none of this in it. He never knew um, being undiscerning, unloving, unmerciful, untrustworthy. He loved God and he loved the truth. He always obeyed his parents. He never lied. He was never prideful or arrogant. He never killed anybody. He was never sexually immoral in any way, shape, or form at all. He was perfectly chaste his whole life. He was not covetous. He was not deceitful. He was not a gossip. And his righteousness is the gift of God to all who repent and believe in him. And that's the, the glory of the good news. God will accept anyone who repents, no matter who they are and no matter what they've done. If they repent and believe the gospel, they will find God to be gracious. But repentance means what God says is a sin, you confess to be a sin too. And until we do that, until we admit that what God says is a sin, is a sin, and in fact we have to turn away from those sins that we know are sins, uh, God is not going to forgive us. We have to be broken like that prostitute in Luke chapter 7. When she came up behind Jesus and fell down at his feet and wept. Why did she do that? Because she was ashamed. She felt ashamed. Of her sins we all have to do that same thing and that's something that never stops it's not like you do it the day you come to Christ you do that every day of your life admit that what God says is true turn from it and believe in Jesus Christ and be saved thank you for watching or for listening